Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Ether Hub. I'm Sabi, bringing you more Magic the Gathering lore. March of the Machine is marching towards your LGS, and now is the perfect time for you to catch up on the story of this set. There were 18 articles chronicalizing the lore of March of the Machine, the end cap to the massive New Phyrexia story arc. As Elish Norn has fulfilled her people's grand purpose to spread the will of Phyrexia throughout the multiverse. This video will break down the main lore points and condense many of those articles into exactly what you need to know about March and Machine's story. Again, this is more of a recap video for those looking to just jump right into the set's story. There are a lot of side events omitted, so if you're interested in catching everything that happened in March of the Machine, be sure to check out my complete playlist linked on your screen right now or in the description below. I want to give credit to all of the amazing authors who worked on these articles. Recognition for their work can also be found in the description. Remember, if you enjoyed my coverage of the MTG story, consider showing the channel your support with a like by becoming a member or subscriber, dropping a super thanks, and of course sharing it with your friends. Now let's move on to the lore. This is the complete story of March of the Machine. The heroic planeswalkers of the Gatewatch hatched a scheme to infiltrate New Phyrexia and decimate their invasion tree, the very thing that would grant them access to an untold number of planes they could conquer. They would do this by using the Silex at its base. They, however, underestimated their opponent as the Phyrexians were numerous and prepared. Many planeswalkers lost their lives and free will, becoming thralls to Elish Norn's purpose. In the last act, we saw Jace Balarin using the Silex, only to be stopped by Kaya and Elspeth. The invasion tree had already connected to the Blind Eternity. The Silex Blast could have easily decimated countless worlds along with New Phyrexia, a cost they refused to bear. Jace was completed. Elspeth planeswalked the exploding Silex to the emptiness of the Blind Eternity, and the remaining planeswalkers were left to face the realization that Elish Norn had won and her invasions begun. Three worms stood before Elish Norn. Kaya, Kaito, and Tyvar they were called. The fear in their eyes begging for mercy. They were misguided. If they would only submit, she would erase their faults. But of course, they would turn down her offer. There was no point in asking, just as there was no point in their resistance. All will be won, and it wouldn't be very long now. Elish Norn tells the worms to stay with her and behold the glory of New Phyrexia. One shouts at her. Another dares to step towards the Mother of Machines, but then the last pulls him back. Even when there were so few of them, the non-believers are never truly united. If only they could see that. Elish Norn opened up five portals to alternate planes to show their skies pulsing red. Phyrexian symbols blazed among the clouds. She watched as the invasion tree, Realmbreaker, burst from the sky, its barbed limbs angering itself in each portal. Rivers of glistening oil ran into the earth while invasion pods took flight in perfect sync. The newly Phyrexianized planeswalker, one of her evangels, Jace Balarin, slips away, knowing what his mother of machines wants without any words. Atraxa and the other Phyrexian evangels, Luca, the human who could control animals, and Ajani, the Leonin warrior, arrive with the most recent member, Nahiri the Lithomancer, trailing behind them. Between them, they carried a bound and wriggling shield dread, whose insect-like armor had been removed to reveal a small, pathetic pretender. Elish Norn looks back at the worms. They knew they were desperate to escape and launch a counterattack. Now that she had transcended death, it was amusing to watch the Fleshbound look for a way out. At her command, Nahiri willed stones to spring from the ground, restraining the three imperfect planeswalkers. They would escape, but as prophets of their united future, telling their unbelieving brethren what they've seen. Shieldred accused her of only caring about herself, wanting unity so others would conform to her mad ravings. Her cares were Phyrexia's cares. The Machine Orthodoxy's doctrine followed the Argent etchings, as they demand to spread the glory of New Phyrexia. Shieldred had always tried to stain the holy teachings, but there was no longer a place in Phyrexia for those who craved power over unity. Elish Norn commanded Ajani to execute Shieldred, who started to scream, but who was cut short by his axe. 
the Black Praetor's head bounced to Elishnorn's feet as dark ichor smeared across her porcelain floor. Servants would remove and process the corpse. One mustn't waste perfectly good parts that would serve Phyrexia as Shirodred could not. Elishnorn turned towards her evangels, asking Nahiri where she was from. The core woman was born on Zendikar, like Nissa the Elf, who possessed the finest gift any planeswalker could give new Phyrexia. She could steer Realmbreaker's branches. At Nissa's behest, the five portals shifted, joining together... The images rippled and formed something new, something complete. She saw a lush ancient forest, elves among the branches of the towering trees, armed and waiting for something in the sky. The branches bent into Phyrexian shapes as a thousand portals like Elish Norns stared down upon Zendikar. The image rippled again as Nyssa showed her the Skyclaves. The precise edges and stark white of the Hedron surrounding the floating city struck her as beautiful. Elish Norn sends Nahiri there, promising forces to join her, so they might acquire an ancient weapon they had once used to dominate the plane. Elish Norn looked to see her prisoners had escaped, planes walking away. She of course had counted on that, though it was a shame they turned away from such beauty. She then turns to Luca who promised to bring the monsters of Ikoria into the fold, wanting the humans of his former home to cower before him. Elish Norn, however, didn't like this answer. Humans already cower before New Phyrexia. Luca's red-aligned anger and bloodlust was dangerous. It lent itself to missteps the planeswalkers would surely use and take advantage of. She was sure Luca would always choose to settle a personal grievance over ensuring the completion of a plane. She sent Luca to Ikoria with a warning that he was no longer a creature of base instinct, but of a greater whole. Looking to Tamio, the Moonfolk scholar, she asked Nissa to show them Kamigawa. People walked the streets of the glittering city. No one was panicking. Perhaps they had accepted completion was nothing to fear, but more likely they just didn't suspect anything was coming. Tamio loved her family on Kamigawa, but she wanted them to know what she had discovered in the unity of Phyrexia. If they were all completed, they would never be apart ever again. Tamio was lost in thought, thinking about her former family, a family she should have replaced with the unity of New Phyrexia. Elish Norn's orders to invade Kamigawa were left unanswered. Silence followed as Tamio watched Realmbreaker pierce the earth and collapse buildings. Elish Norn repeats Tamio's name, but still, silence. Atraxa takes flight, her wings covering the portal from view, reprimanding Tamio for her insolence. Tamio blinks, not knowing what came over her. Then, without hesitation, she left to take control of Kamigawa. Now, Elish Norn turns toward Ajani, not wanting him to go to his home plane, but rather to Theros. Instead of silence, there was understanding as he looked through the portal to see ships on the red waves sailing underneath the two guardian statues. As Realmbreaker's white branches gained purchase, marble crumbled and black oil streaked across the white. Winged constructs descended onto the ships where sailors' spears bounced off their metallic carapaces. Ajani knew she wouldn't be sending him there just to lead the forces that were already doing a fine job. He was far too clever, a trait that was too individual for Phyrexia. They saw Thassa, god of the sea, protecting her temple fighting off Phyrexian ships with her bident. She wanted Ajani to bring the gods of Theros to harmonize with New Phyrexia. It was belief that made the gods on Theros. Ajani would take priests of the machine orthodoxy to preach from the Argent etchings and get the inhabitants to believe that all will be one. Ajani planes walked away, ever loyal and clever, but didn't guess the real reason she sent him to Theros. She asked Nyssa to show them New Capanna, a plane that had been attacked by Yawgmoth Phyrexia during the first invasion. There was a golden gate with a haze that rendered all details fuzzy, the work of the angels that had sealed Phyrexia away from the plane's survivors. Fearing the truth, Capanna's angels gave up their physical forms to keep the citizens from unity. That all would end now with the angel of Elish Norn's creation, accomplishing what their predecessors could not. Atraxa was to find and destroy the Halo Wellspring, the substance consisting of Angel's ethereal forms, which was poisonous to Phyrexians. There was nothing left of Atraxa's original form except what was perfect, but her previous life as an Angel of Mirrodin might lend her some protection from this vile substance, this Halo. There was a silence as Elish Norn thought carefully about how to tell Atraxa the importance of her role. 
There was a danger in conquering New Capenna, as well as Theros, and that danger couldn't be allowed to triumph. Atraxa flew away, leaving Elish Norn with Nyssa, who was preoccupied with managing Realmbreaker. There was a silence that Elish Norn loathes and quickly calls her attendants to recite her own teachings aloud. Their screeching would drown out her nightmares, and the woman cloaked in white who stalks them. Elish Norn's perfect creation, Atraxa, leads the assault on Nukapana personally. When first ordered, there was a small flicker of confusion. Why send her to attack this world? She would of course never question her mother, but still, something in her had doubt. Norn had said something on Nukapana must be stopped, the font of Halo as the natives call it. And still, something dangerous exists on this world for their kind an aura that made her solid carapace tingle with anticipation, a hazy light that encompassed the invasion pods as they dropped through the clouds. The mother of machines wants this world scoured, and so it will be. This world was filled with sin and filth, and Atraxa would be their savior, introducing them to the One. The attack goes much like the others. Phyrexians attack and begin to assimilate the populace. As they join their family, Atraxa's mind melds with the newly transformed, gifted glimpses of their memories before all individuality is lost. She uses these minds to find what she's looking for. Some, calling themselves maestros, are the most curious. They speak of a museum, of things of beauty. The word feels strange to Atraxa. In moments after her creation, closing her eyes would show her images, flashes of a flower growing in a field, a light fading, a carved figure. She understood these to be beautiful, but they're not Phyrexian, so they are abhorrent. Beauty to her now means anything against Phyrexia's unity, and whatever is against Phyrexia must be destroyed. Atraxa makes her way to this museum and is revolted by what she sees inside. Images of canvas and paint depicting singular figures, monuments to an individual put above the whole. It was an affront to Phyrexia. She slashes it through. She delivers the same blow to anything the newly corrupted maestros found beautiful, hearing their final mental gasps before they accept their new purpose and join the fold. Near the back of the museum, she finds a grand carving of granite and marble, a statue, showing a mock battle between Phyrexians of old and inhabitants here. In its beauty, it mocks Phyrexia. They built a lasting reminder of their failure, the mortals' failure to join their unity. Why would they praise that? With a quick strike, it no longer mocks her. As she leaves the museum to continue her mission, she runs into another beauty. Stone faces of angels, statues. It burns her heart with a feeling she should ignore as a high-ranking Phyrexian leader. It's a reminder of what she once was, before her perfection. The reminder lands Atraxa into the throes of anger, lopping off the statue's heads and smashing it repeatedly until they're nothing but dust, paying no mind to the golden mist pouring from it, stinging at her eyes and burning her lungs. When finished, Atraxa was renewed in her glorious purpose and sets back to attacking the large tower of New Capenna, the one which kisses the sky itself. She sees mortal beings climbing up it to escape their campaign. She sets Phyrexians after them with one silent thought. Though, they report a strange feeling as they climb, a burning and weakness. Atraxa looks up at the headless figures. A deep calm comes over her. Beauty is dead, and she can turn her attentions once more to the front, to the beings on the outside of the tower and what they might be planning. She leaves the platform, but the Seraphs remain, watching her go with their visitor hovering among them in a haze of color. They too speak among themselves, saying, Why not stop her? asks this visitor. It is not yet time, they answer. It doesn't feel like the right answer, but the visitor cannot disprove it. Again, the voices ring out. Have faith. It's almost here, the end. You'll know what to do when we've gotten there. Chandra follows the plan, as painful as it may be for her. There had to be others not bound for the hell that is New Phyrexia to sit and wait. Wait for news of the others, their victory or barring that, their deaths. Chandra and the others would wait for that news and act accordingly, either a celebration of their triumph 
or war, all dependent on the strike team's fate. In a small safe house on a plot of land that once housed Vess Manor on Dominaria, Liliana hosted Chandra, Vivian Reed, and the Dryad, Ren. Time passed slowly, as if Tefiri was still somehow with them channeling a spell. Soon, however, their time would be up. Two weeks was all they allotted for waiting. If no news came back after two weeks, they would assume the entire strike team had died, and they would move on to plan two, all-out war against New Phyrexia. Chandra, of course, hated waiting. More so, she hated not knowing what was happening to her friends, to Nyssa in particular. Their relationship had always been strong, though it had been shattered and reforged a few times over their years together. There was still no one she cared for more, and she just wanted news of her safety. But news was scarce. In thinking back on this threat, the New Phyrexians, Chandra's hatred boiled. They were monsters, who changed people into monsters. A Johnny, Tamio, they had forgotten who they were. Those countless people on Dominaria who had fallen, were they even people anymore? Any shred of empathy burned away. She didn't bother herself with such deep philosophical questions. Her fire would torch any Phyrexian under any circumstance. Chandra spends most of her time mentoring Ren, a dryad who bonds with trees and shares their strength. They connected over their ties to fire. Ren is bound to trees to help keep a magical fire inside her body from expanding out and incinerating her. Chandra had learned much from Jaya, a pyromancer and another casualty of the Phyrexians. She's gone now, and somehow Chandra is now the mentor. It doesn't fit her, at least she doesn't think so, but still, Chandra helps Ren control the burning trapped within her. Until a signal is loosed above their safe house. Some of the strike team had returned. Chandra paused. Though she hated waiting, she hated more knowing and finding out the worst. She pushed through that anxiety and walked into the safe house to see just three members of the strike team there, none of them being Nyssa. Tyvar, Kaya, and Kaido were sitting around a table of potions and herbs as Liliana attended to their wounds. The news wasn't good. Of course it wasn't. Kaivar explains how their corrupted world tree, dubbed Realmbreaker, had succeeded in its mission. The Phyrexians now had access to every plane, and they were attacking. New Phyrexia itself was lost. Elish Norn had prepared for each and every one of their actions. The group tells her about Nyssa. The news hits her with the weight of a star. Though deep down she had already known the answer when she noticed Nyssa had it returned with them. A swirl of emotions overtake her, but she somehow keeps her head for the time being. Vivian Reed asks where Jace is. Liliana sarcastically answers he's fashionably late as always. Tyvar is the one to break the news. Jace wouldn't be joining them either. Liliana takes the news hard, but doesn't show it to the others. At first, she doesn't even believe them. Surely Jace planned this whole thing. He doesn't lose once he's made a plan. He just doesn't. The survivors tell them the story. How the tree connected to dozens of planes. How Jace tried to use the Silex regardless of what untold destruction it could cause. Elspeth running her sword through him and making a noble sacrifice with the Silex. Only four of them had returned, and the Wanderer wasn't among them because of her unstable spark. Chandra wants action, her emotions starting to again get the better of her. Surely they could go back to New Phyrexia and find another way to cut down that damned tree. Kaya tries to reason with her, it's just not possible. They had a plan, and they were stopped easily. Rushing head first would amount to only their own deaths. Chandra doesn't care. She'll go and burn it down herself. Liliana too gets up in anger, but instead she plans to go to Strixhaven to help prepare for the plane's defense. The group must now focus on their next action, prevent the loss of any further heroes, save those they can from this initial invasion in the hopes of mustering a force to strike back. They must travel far and wide, spread the news of the Phyrexian invasion, and build up their resistance. Chandra, however, doesn't like this plan. She announces that she'll return to New Phyrexia herself, take the tree down with the help of those still unaffected by the Phyrexian's blight there. Should they abandon the Mirans there to die? No one answers her, because they all know the uncomfortable truth. The mortals left on New Phyrexia were but the first casualties of a much greater war. Chandra tries in vain to convince anyone of her plan. Even Liliana for a moment considers it, but rushing in, that's just not her. 
She travels back to Strixhaven and leaves Chandra to her little adventure. Chandra cannot admit defeat on New Phyrexia, because if it's gone, then Nyssa is also truly gone. If they can retake New Phyrexia, maybe, just maybe, they can do something for the infected. For those lost, bring them back. No one else is on board, so Chandra wanders out alone, taking in fresh air before heading to New Phyrexia alone. Before she goes, a crying Chandra feels the approach of Ren, who listened to the Pyromancer's reasoning and actually agreed with her. Defending planes was righteous, but the corruption would only stop once it was dug up from the roots. The world tree must be dealt with. Still, there were only two. Three, if you count Ren's tree companion she called Seven. Ren suggests they can join Tefiri, but Chandra's confused. No one knew where he was, or if he was even still alive. He was lost in his temporal anchor when the Phyrexians attacked. His spirit was lost to time, or so she thought. Ren told her that she had spent some time with Tefiri, and he taught her how to follow threads. That time was like a thread, that can sometimes become knotted. She could feel him out there, captured in a knot, and she could unwind it, bring him back, but she needed help. As for the World Tree, they may not have a Silex anymore, but they did have another weapon. The fire that burned within Ren, it was merely contained by her Treefolk companion. Seven hadn't the strength to truly let it loose. That power could, however, be used by something as magnificent as this corrupted World Tree. Ren explained how she could hear its song like any other tree throughout the multiverse. It was distant and in pain, but it cried out and it was alive. It could be the one to temper Ren's internal fire, and it would burn free the corruption of the Phyrexians. All this talk about fire was something Chandra could finally understand. Together they would travel off to New Phyrexia. They would untie Tefiri from his maddened time and join with the Mirans for another attack on the Phyrexian world tree. Then, Ren would bond with this entity, bring her fire into it, purge the corruption, and close the door of the multiverse off for Elish Norn. It was a plan Chandra could get behind, and honestly, she was just happy to have some company. She feared what she was walking into, but that fear was lessened with Ren by her side. They planeswalk together, alone. There's no one to see them off. At least, no one they can see. But there is someone watching the safe house, and the people within it huddled together in search of purpose and direction. A trick of the light might reveal them, or it might not. A keen nose might notice their scent, or it might not. But they are there, watching. All of this feels familiar to them, like a song whose lyrics have long since faded away. Over and over, they try to remember, and yet the words float away. Only the melody remains. The Watcher isn't alone. There are others, too, seen and yet unseen. The Watcher asks one of them, What is it we're seeing? Why are we here? The answer comes like the trumpet of war horns. We are here to witness the beginning of the end. Tamiyo completed and driven purely to see all united under the perfection of Phyrexia, floats above her former home, the world of Kamigawa, in one of its technologically advanced cities. Advanced in the eyes of the unpure, sure, but in completion, all are unified and will truly become advanced. Their lights and trinkets now are meaningless. Tamiyo had always been a keeper of stories, a writer of the chronological history of the multiverse. Those stories now lend her strength through the magic they weaved. In her hand now is a tome bound by iron, a sacred parchment she swore never to read again. A story she had sealed from her mind. Now, she would unleash it, as the misguided Kami of her former home attacked her in vain. Lesser stories that no longer held meaning to her protected Tamiyo from their onslaught, as she continued to read the story aloud. The wizard Urza creates an heir from pure, unvarnished metal. He names him Karn. The same spark of creation that birthed him burns brightly in his breast. Karn too must create. As a sculptor chipping at marble, he shapes his world. When it is done, the creatures named and granted boons, the climate carefully crafted, the earth shaped and polished. He appoints his own successor, Memnark, to oversee it. She watches over as Phyrexian agents attack the world and bring it to heel. 
trains careen off their tracks, black oil drips and darkens the rivers, completing both fish and those looking to catch them. The kami run and scream in anguish, the soul of this plane, as they too find their ends. They vanish in a puff of impossible smoke as Phyrexian Lance meets their incorporeal bodies. Soon, the entire city basks in the fog of dead kami. Even the tree tying the physical and spiritual worlds together, Bozaiju, is shattered, its bark splintering and dripping the same ichor that now covers Tamiyo's tome. More kami burst forth without a home, and more fog clouds the sky. A part of Tamiyo nestled deep in her mind feels their pain, but this is what's best for Kamigawa, a world torn by endless wars. With Phyrexia, they will finally know peace, as she does. Still, her story continues to be read aloud. Memnarch, the heir's heir, is a copy of a copy, a faded image of Urza himself. It longs for the power its grandfather wielded as easily as a poet wields a brush. It longs for its parents' ability to create. It longs to see more. Over years, it plucks life from this plane and that, settling them all within this garden, waiting for the flowers to come. And they do, but they aren't the flowers Memnarch expects. These bloom in black oil. Their choking roots wrap around that which is alive and whole. Soon, the whole garden drowns beneath the oil. The heir returns to discover his home has been torn asunder. The scroll itself becomes oil in Tamiyo's hand, dripping between her fingers. This is how the story ends, and how it always ended with Phyrexia's victory. The planes are under attack. The surviving planeswalkers pivot to plan B. Originally, Kaya was set to defend Ravnica with Teo and Ralzarek, but they were both skilled, with Ral having made a contingency plan for Ravnica's defense. Instead, Kaya joins Kaido on Kamigawa. His message seemed urgent. The Phyrexian attack there seemed brutal, and he was without help. The Wanderer was still wandering, it appeared. She planeswalks to a world under siege. Giant Phyrexian monstrosities tear down buildings, while quick, horrific dogs run rampant through the streets. Kaya uses her magic to phase through the rubble, helping a little boy and his dog along the way, all before bumping into Kaido, already covered in blood and oil and sweat. They know their target. Tamiyo is above all, commanding both troops and reading a story that's twisting reality. This tome would ensure Phyrexia's victory on Kamigawa. If they have any hopes in staving off the death of this plane, Tamiyo must be removed. Kaya is an assassin, but this is a friend they're talking about. Kaido volunteers for this unsavory job. This is personal. Kaya is to gather up willing Kami and aid in this attack. This has to end. As Kaido prepares to climb up the barks of the now shattered ancient tree of his world, he feels the small tug and meek voice of a child, the boy Kaya had saved. It was a little Nozumi, a rat folk of their plane. He asked if he was going to fight the woman floating above them. The Nozumi began to cry, weeping that it was his mother up there. She looked wrong, but it was her. Kaido had heard of a family mentioned by Tamiya before her corruption. Her child in heart and mind. His name was Nashi. This was Nashi, pleading for his mother's life, though Kaido wasn't sure there was life left to save. Despite the odds, Kaido listens to Nashi's plan, to have him simply talk to his mother. Maybe it would jar her from New Phyrexia's hold. Who knows? Stranger things have happened, right? With Kaido protecting him from behind, Nashi approaches his possessed mother, talking with her like he had on any other night she would just share stories with him before bed. He pleaded with her that this wasn't who she was, that she was being controlled by someone else. Tamiya's head twists unnaturally 180 degrees, followed by her body shortly after. She whispers Nashi's name and flings metal shards from one of her floating scrolls. They would have torn through the little Nazumi if not for Kaido's quick reflexes. Tamiyo's voice is like the screeching of a thousand cicadas, chittering about wanting nothing but peace and happiness for Nashi, to share the perfection of unity with him. As soon as Nashi descended, Tamiyo launched her attack on Kaido, slashing with razor claws and augmented scrolls designed to rip and shred. There was truly nothing left behind her oil-drenched eyes. Only quick instinct and well-polished armor stood between Kaido and certain death. Tamiyo grows frustrated, why rebel against this gift, against everything he's ever wanted? 
just let her family come home to Phyrexia. But Kaido is fighting for more than just himself, more than just his family. He's fighting for everyone, everywhere. His sword glances between scrolls and tomes as he deflects shard after shard volleyed at him. Tamio grabs him by the feet as he dances and jumps from another strike, dangling him high above the ruin that was once his home. He uses his blade to cut free the fabric Tamio used as a hold and fell. He found soft purchase, however, as a friend finally arrived. It was the Wanderer, his Emperor, joined by Kaya, and they all now rode upon the guardian spirit of Kamigawa, Kyodai, the Kami bound to the Wanderer destined to protect this plane. Tamio faces the Wanderer, whose graceful dance eludes even the quickest scroll shard shot at her, using her blade in kind to deflect what she couldn't dodge. Tamio backs away and lands next to a now frightened Nashi, placing a cold hand atop his head. She pulls out a scroll bound by iron, the final chapter in this terrible story she's been weaving. Kaido doesn't know what follows, but whatever it was, it wouldn't be good. Nashi is too shocked to move from his former mother as her lips start to form words. The Wanderer screams at the Kaodai, the spirit dragon breathing its magical essence onto its emperor and empowering her, her blade bathing in the white mana of the Guardian Kami. In a flash of white and the sound of galing wind, the Wanderer cuts low Tamio before a word leaves her lips. Tamio falls, as Kaido tried to shield little Nashi from the sight. A voice comes from the aftermath, a voice similar to Tamio's, similar to what her voice used to sound like, but it was rather distant and aloof. Faintly glowing characters of blue, words and letters of various languages began to pour from an ironbound scroll near the corpse of Tamio. They swirled and collected into the loose silhouette of Tamio. It explained in a calm voice that this was the story of Tamio, the story unending, a collection of her memories bound in a tome to be released upon her death. It had hoped it would never have to be, but here it was, continuing the story of a planeswalker who collected the tales of the multiverse, totally freed of the corruption that took her physical form. All doubt of this, memories, and tensions were removed as the characters reached down to Nashi and embraced him mother and child reunited. This was Tamio's final story in life, allowing herself to fall just to be with her family again, at least in some capacity. The final chapter of her story that should never have been read now had a much different ending. Rather than the victory of Phyrexia that she was trying to bring, it read as, Once upon a time there was a great evil, one that threatened to swallow the planes of the multiverse whole, unfeeling and uncaring and infected the hearts of those it encountered. There was someone who fought against it. There was a protector in white. Kamigawa was still under siege, but there was now hope. Forces of the plane gathered around Elish Norn's planar anchor prepared to fight for their world. The group took a moment to breathe. The war wasn't over, but at least they had this one small victory. Chandra and Ren had traveled, despite fell warnings from their friends, to New Phyrexia. Kaido, Kaya, and Tyvar had painted an image of this foul place that, upon seeing it with her own eyes, Chandra didn't recognize. They said it was like a living monster, and that you were in its belly. Instead, Chandra saw almost nothing. The world was encased in white porcelain and a blinding light. This truly was Elish Norn's domain. One of the first things they spot is the tree, the corrupted seedling of Kaldheim that granted the Phyrexians passage to the multiverse. It was something you couldn't miss. It was so big that Chandra guessed that you could spot it from any point on New Phyrexia. To her, the crown of this tree didn't even exist. Ren said nothing of the giant tree, her target, but encouraged them to keep moving, her internal fire crackling with an excitement Chandra shared. As they march through the shockingly sparse landscape, they see figures making their way down a tall white needle-like tower. From their appearance, they weren't Phyrexian, but not totally human either. These must be the native Mirrodins. Chandra felt vindicated. She knew there was still life fighting here. Life she would help if she could. They met up with the leader of this company, a man named Koth, a planeswalker, Chandra soon learns. One who's sworn to not leave his home to die. 
He says they just finished a mission to take down Elish Nord's scrambling device, the very thing that prevented planeswalkers from coordinating an assault on New Phyrexia, which now allowed her and Ren to easily travel here together. Standing with his companion, the Phoresis carrying Malira, they discuss their options and plan. Koth didn't hide his disappointment. Only two planeswalkers to fight this entire plane of Phyrexians? Chandra and Ren did mention that a third, a time mage named Tefiri, would be joining them. Maybe. But there wasn't a lot of faith in those claims. Ren was quick to go over her strategy, being a dryad who confused with the essence of trees, using them as she would her own body, and her hearing this tortured seedling cry out for aid. Ren was confident that she could meld with the invasion tree and turn it against the enemy. Now, all they had to do was get to its base. Elish Norn had grown more lax on New Phyrexia, her attention being drawn to the newly available multiverse at her fingers. Still, the World Tree's base was far and wide the most heavily guarded place on the plane. They would need to get creative, and have help if they wanted to make it through. The help Chandra and Ren are presented to isn't what they had expected. It was a Phyrexian, introduced to them as Urabrask. Urabrask had been helping with the Mirren Resistance since he returned to New Phyrexia. He ideologically opposes the rule of Elish Norn, as her dogma stifles creativity as well as change that's needed for New Phyrexia to survive. There must not and cannot be a single New Phyrexia, and this is what Urabrask fights against. Through his hidden cove on the outskirts of the Invasion Tree's base, their position is blocked from the prying eyes of Norn and all of her minions. However, a simple glance is all it will take for her to find them and snuff them out. Their attack must be quick, and Chandra is shocked at what Urabrask suggests. It's the most simple plan she had ever heard, especially in one that would decide the fate of the multiverse. Jace had always thought and then double thought of each foreseeable scenario before finally settling on a convoluted, overly complex plan of action. Now, facing the end of the multiverse as they knew it, Koth would use his geomancy to fling Chandra and Ren onto the world tree. The Mirren Resistance would go out and pick a fight with a small band of guards, draw Norn's attention just long enough to keep the skies cleared, then they would be flung over the divide. As soon as they touched the tree, Elish Norn would know, so they had to act quick. There was another consideration. Seven, the tree bound to Ren, was starting to blacken along its edges, breathing in the oil-laden air of this plane. There was no telling how much longer it could last. Urabrask describes an elf aiding Norn with important tasks near the platform they were aiming to land. Chandra knew who the Phyrexian was referring to, though she too understood the stakes. Opening the possibility of maybe rescuing her was simply an added bonus. They took their positions. The Mirans shouted a war cry. Koth's fire erupted beneath Chandra and Ren as their fated journey to the invasion tree took flight. The travel wasn't as easy as Urabrask suggested it would be. While flying on their metallic platforms, creatures flying on wings of sharp white metal, looking like a mix between a bird and a bat, began to attack them. Ren grabbed one, or rather Seven did, using the Phyrexian as a club against others of its kind. Chandra simply melted those coming close until they uselessly fell to the ground below. The flight was indeed quick. And suddenly, Chandra feels the crash of them hitting the invasion tree. The force broke one of her ribs. Suddenly, the white bony plates reinforcing the tree began to shift and take on different shapes. Elish Norn's tree guard. Chandra quickly douses them with flames, as Ren turns her attention to the tree and the ritual that would meld her into it. But the Centurions, they don't press their attack. They collectively open their mouths and speak in unison. They speak a voice Chandra recognizes. Of course. Who else would Norn send? It was Nyssa. The lifeless mouthpieces speak the lies of Phyrexia, that with unity comes peace, power, and never feeling alone. Your weaknesses will be replaced with strength, a glorious purpose you will share with your new family. The message doesn't reach Chandra. She's focused on the face of whom she had once cared so deeply for. Nyssa floated past the inert guards. It was Nyssa, but at the same time, not Nyssa. She had two extra arms, one blade-like in appearance, with black oil staining around her eyes. Even when she talked, there seemed to be an interference as if Elish Norn was using Nyssa as a loudspeaker. Through all of Nyssa's lecturing about how great being completed is, Chandra can't say anything but Nyssa's name. 
trying in vain to find anything that resembled hope that the person she once knew was still in there. But somehow, this completed Nyssa knew and understood so much about Chandra. Her fears, her doubts, her lack of patience, everything. But there was no doubt, it was just Elish Norn manipulating Nyssa's memories. Ren attempted something that resembled an attack, but it was stopped effortlessly by the completed Nyssa. Centurions tossed porcelain spears at Chandra, most missing her flesh, but pinning her against the tree by her clothing. One ripped through her calf, making it difficult and painful to move. Nyssa turned her attention to the dryad. Using her blade-like arm, she cut through even the thickest branches of Seven like it was paper, each unimpeded strike removing more of the tree folk until only the naked dryad remained, buckled over in pain. Nyssa revealed that their entire plan was easily deduced by Elish Norn, and thwarting it was child's play. Their mother of machines had already reinforced the tree, modified it against heat. She sent Nyssa specifically to welcome Chandra to her new family. She had known every aspect of their plan from the very beginning. Even now, the last of the Mirren resistance was being dealt with by a greater force than they had anticipated. Chandra sees hope falling apart around her. The heat of her flames begin to tickle behind her eyes. She must stay calm. Blowing up now does nothing. It may dent the tree and kill everyone around them, but it wouldn't do lasting damage. She wishes Jaya was here, or Gideon. Her fire melts the javelins, pinning her to the invasion tree. She slumps over in pain and looks up at Nyssa's completed form. When she speaks this time, it isn't metallic. It isn't Elish Norn. It's Nyssa's voice, her true self speaking through. Again, she begs Chandra to join her, to be with her forever. They would escape pain, responsibility, and just be a family. Chandra paused, fire welling up. For a moment, she considered it. Being with Nyssa, being free of fear, of doubt, of the judgment of others. There would always be threats to the multiverse. Tyrants, Bolas, the Eldrazi. Where does it end? And joining Nyssa, maybe all of that would finally end at least for them. She sees past Nyssa. Ren is still alive, crawling towards the exposed tree, beginning to weave her magic. Chandra wasn't alone. She had a home. She had people she fought for. Though she missed Nyssa with every fiber of her being, Chandra rejected her offer. Nyssa's demeanor instantly shifted to anger and rage. All of Chandra's stored magic, the power of a burning sun coursing through her, the bottle finally shattered as the pyromancer targeted the blast directly towards the branch of the invasion tree they had landed on. The orange wave was followed by a vaporizing heat directly downwards. The resulting explosion launched Nyssa, Chandra, and the Centurion guards from the tree, while Ren, who was close to the trunk, managed to hang on. Ren was left there, alone, the fate of the multiverse now resting with her. Her memory is foggy. She's not sure if she has any to speak of. Before appearing, the last thing she remembers is fear. All of a sudden, she faces a scene that seems vaguely familiar, maybe somewhere deep in the recesses of her mind. It's a girl, young, cowering in a corner. They're in a dungeon. It's dark and humid. There's a metal beast clenched in its jaws as an older woman, the child's mother. If this happened before, this time would have a different outcome. The girl is too weak to defend herself, but bathed in light, drawing a sword, this figure had the power to protect her. Killing the monster was effortless. She remembered, maybe, it being more difficult. The girl speaks to her now. Elspeth, it's time to wake up. The world shifts around her. Reality melds to whatever the girl desires. Or maybe what Elspeth desires, yet isn't consciously aware of. This is, after all, her younger self. And this is merely her story. Her destiny regarding Phyrexia may have started here, but where it ends is completely up to her. Whispers in her mind come to her. It's time to make a choice. She has the power now to change fate, but the choice can only be made once, and only choosing correctly would change the course of this war. She remembers now, Elspeth Terrell. Her memories, they flooded back. The Silex, the explosion. Was she dead? She remembers her friends, her allies, arguing, planning. She sees now that nothing would have been enough. None of it ever would have been enough. 
the weight of the burden falls to her. Before, it would have made her buckle under it. Now she had true strength, as feathers danced in the light of the cosmos. The voice. The dismembered voice of... Was it a god? A deity she had once prayed to? Elspeth couldn't be certain, but she again collapsed the world around her to show Elspeth a new scene. New Capanna. Elspeth recognized her former home, the city she had been welcomed to twice in her life. The streets flooded with blood as the screams of the new Capanans deafened everything else. She sees there a mockery of an angel, Elish Norn and the Praetor's greatest creation, their most fervent general, Atraxa. The sight of her makes Elspeth sick. The Phyrexian barks orders up an impossible tower. Survivors try in vain to save those not yet turned. They're losing. Atraxa was specifically told to give no quarter. There would be no survivors of New Capenna. Elspeth's plane would be lost. As her rage boils, she remains outwardly calm. This choice is not one that can be made off emotions, off of personal agendas. The right choice would save the multiverse. Was that choice to save New Capenna? Elspeth listens, hearing faint whispers. The angels of this plane still lived. They plotted. They would soon stand again as guardians against the Phyrexians. As much as it pained her, Elspeth turns the page of New Capenna. This is not where she should intervene. Again, the world shifts and reforms. Elspeth sees glimpses of other planes, some she knows and others she's seen for the first time, all of which are bathed in the red glow of Norn's invasion tree. A black bride singing a haunted song over an army of zombies. A friend near a cabin weeping. Giant beasts ripping into metal flesh. Flashes of everywhere. And everyone was dying. A more vivid scene appears. She knows this place. The rolling hills and temples of Pharos. She's brought to a temple as a new voice speaks to her. The voice of her beloved Daxos. Gone from her for far too long. Daxos explains that Ajani has come here, that he's been corrupting the gods of Theros one at a time. Already three have fallen. And here in this temple, he guides a priestess to drink in the oil, and another god will fall. This time, the god of the forge. Elspeth watches her friend, no more, Ajani, slaughter innocent children in the name of his new masters. This isn't him. If she chooses Theros, a place she once called home, she could save Ajani. Save the gods. It was a tempting offer. Completed gods would surely end Theros. No one could defend against that. And she felt she owed her mentor a great debt. But as she thought, the rationale she chose was out of personal attachments. Picking Theros didn't mean the saving of a Johnny. It meant the freeing of his soul. She would most likely have to kill him. Even if she did somehow cleanse him, Ajani was just a single planeswalker, certainly not enough to turn the tide. This wasn't the right choice. As much as it pained her to admit, the voice of Daxos suddenly agreed. And again, Elspeth is whisked away. More flashes of planes fighting and losing to Phyrexia. All deserve to be saved, but not all will be. She had to make the right choice for any of them to have a chance. Next, she appeared on a world that she had hoped to never see again. The red, twisting sky. The corrupted world tree. There was no mistaking it. She had been brought to New Phyrexia itself. Her incorporeal form makes its way to the base of the world tree, where her enemy, Elish Norn, sits on a decadent throne of white porcelain. In front of Norn is Urabrask, their erstwhile ally, a Phyrexian predator in his own right. He was captured strapped to a table, being slowly tortured and torn apart to the joints, all at Norn's command. With one final snap of her fingers, her fervent followers hack and chop at the restrained Praetor. He was nothing more than parts to them, and like parts, he was dissected and removed without a second thought. Next, they brought in more dismembered bits, this time of one she remembers, Karn. Elspeth's shocked the golem still lives, his eyes faintly glowing with light, but with pain overtaking any other expression. Norn is celebrating, bathing in her victory. Elspeth slowly removes her sword. The voice of the magical woman guiding her warns the eager fighter that the wrong choice will ensure their defeat. She must think, what is the goal? What is the purpose of the gift she is about to receive? Killing Elish Norn, right? That had to be the answer. This all can stop with her death. 
but she again thinks. Phyrexia is guided by her hand, but it exists outside of her. The spirit guiding Elspeth through her transformation is revealed to be Sarah, a planeswalker of the past who had once created her own realm, a world of angels, which left her blinded to the greater multiverse outside. She tells her of a story, her story, how a powerful wizard visited her seeking aid, how what followed that wizard was the doom of everything she knew. It was this, not Elish Norn, but Phyrexia. It rose again without her, their mother of machines, and it would again. A new god of machines would simply take her place. This threat isn't carried by Elish Norn alone. She believes it begins and ends with her, but she's wrong. Killing her will not end this. Before the Mother of Machines, Mirren survivors are shackled and beaten. She announces their impending gift, a mercy that Phyrexia bestows to all. Among the rabble, three others are brought. Planeswalkers, Friends, Ka, Chandra, and Ren, all bleeding, beaten, with Ren missing her treefolk companion. Karn lets out a soft groan. The Mirren resistance will end here. What was left of Mirrodin will die here. A completed Nyssa then floats in, exclaiming her contempt and pity for these traitors. Norn gestures for her chief architect to enter. Jin Gitaxius slinks through the gathered Phyrexians. He would get the honor of personally completing these rebels, including the Planeswalkers. Time stops. Elspeth hopes to see Tefiri, staff in hand, coming to their rescue. But hope is a lost luxury on New Phyrexia. The spirit speaks to her again. It's time to choose. Still, her mind thinks of Norn, anger driving her decision. But as time slowly progresses, she sees a shining angelic figure coalescing between Jingitaxius and Koth, the Praetor's first target. It's her. Time is catching up. What is her choice? It is not anger or revenge that will save the multiverse. It is benevolence. It is helping the weak. It is saving others. In the standing nothingness, focus is sharpened. The figures are fuzzy, but two stand out. The Dryad Wren and the completed Nyssa Ravain. But why? Are they important? Are they the major players in all of this? Wren's face is desperate. She reaches for the World Tree, knowing she'll fail. And why Nyssa? She was already gone, lost to Norn. A loose, spectral thread tied these two together. She sees now what must be done. Nyssa isn't to be saved, but distracted. Ren must be free to meld with the invasion tree. That is the answer. When a limb has gone rotten, it must be removed. Ren had told her that once, and now this was her choice. The voice she had listened to throughout this journey melds into a cacophony of all of those who she had loved. Her mother, Daxos, Ajani. All her life, she's been asleep. It's time to wake up. Time to become what she's always meant to be. Jin Gitaxius raises his claw. Elspeth's sword is there to meet it. Mirrodin fell because of Karn. In his arrogance, he'd shaped the plane. In his hubris, he'd left Memnark in charge of it. In his ignorance, he'd spread Phyrexian oil across the plane. If he had paid more attention, he might have seen Memnark lose his way, or the oil dripping in his wake. But he didn't. They shouldn't follow him. All of this was a problem he created. Karn had sworn to honor Venzer's memory, the planeswalker who came to find him while he was infected with Phoresis, who'd given his own spark to let Karn live. Venzer had sacrificed himself because he had seen something in him worth fighting for, and if Karn let himself die now, he'd be betraying his friend. Karn had almost died back then but almost all the friends who saved him were here now fighting. They shouldn't follow him, but Venzer's spark was in him and followed him all the way here. He looked around at Koth, Chandra, and Malira, all beaten to the ground. After all their time struggling against the impossible, the sacrifices, all they'd work for, they were all going to die here. When they first arrived, there were dozens of Mirren would-be rescuers. Now, only about 25 survivors still had all their limbs. The others were dragged off by Jingitaxius to be spliced or be used in foul experiments. One of Norn's singers takes Karn's head and positions it so he has to look at her horrific face. Jingitaxius lifted his wicked claws to strike him, and Karn closed his eyes. 
seeking comfort in ghosts from his past. Then, a golden light swallowed them, so bright only Karn was built to see through it. An angel in gleaming armor, her golden sword raised and aiming for Jingataxius. When she lands, she makes a crater in the metal beneath her, sending Phyrexians tumbling over the platform into the abyss. Elishnorn's choir fell over the edge as well, releasing Karn's head to clink on the ground. The angel spoke a warning, in a voice Karn knew. Elishnorn knew the voice as well. It was Elspeth Terrell with radiant golden wings. Elspeth lets Jingataxius scramble to his escape as she leans down to heal the wounds on Chandra's face. In anger, Elishnorn stands up, throwing over her own throne and crushing a few of her subordinates. Elspeth does not dignify Norn with a response. Instead, she moved to heal Koth. Elishnorn furiously throws a porcelain piece of her throne at Elspeth, who's unfazed as it shatters against her wing. The ranks of Phyrexia now feel something. Something like shock. Something like fear. They begin to pull back, and the Mirren resistance sees their chance. Koth gets up and drives his fist into the ground, sending magma shooting from below. Elishnorn ignores them and snatches whatever she can find to hurl at Elspeth, but none of it concerns the angel. Jingataxius approaches Elishnorn, reminding her that the prisoners were escaping. Elishnorn grabs him by the throat their spat distracting them from seeing Malira run and grab Karn's head. Ren couldn't get up. Not yet. There wasn't much of her left. She no longer had legs. But she still carried the weight of the world on her shoulders. She tells Chandra they need to go. But the pyromancer is distracted by the angel Elspeth Terrell's radiance. Chandra snapped back to reality and scooped up Ren and carried her away, followed by the surviving Mirren resistance. Koth calls for the platform that holds Karn and Malira to come to him. The stone answers him the way Wood answered Ren. They escaped the barrage of arrows, but they couldn't avoid a completed Nyssa. She strode after them, inevitable, flinging bodies out of her way, no compassion or mercy left in those eyes. Ren knew Chandra couldn't bring herself to hurt Nyssa, though there was nothing left of who the elven planeswalker used to be. They needed to get to the tree, though Ren didn't know how. All she had was faith. Phyrexia rages, but it cannot break Elspeth's peace. As Elish Norn throws chunks of porcelain at her, she doesn't flinch. She's above all of that now. Once, she'd found Elish Norn frightening, but not anymore. All the dross of Elspeth's life had been cut away, leaving only truth. The truth is that Phyrexia will not win this day. Elish Norn stretches her claws and grabs Elspeth's leg, slamming her to the ground. Elspeth's ears ring, and her vision blurs as Elishnord stands over her. The Praetor lifts shards of metal from the dead bodies around her, weaving herself a new, hideous suit of armor. Elspeth looked over her shoulder to see Nyssa stalking her allies as they attempted to escape. Elspeth concentrated on her blade, sending a searing beam of light at Elishnorn. Chunks of Norn's new armor fall away, but she raises a smoking hand, bidding the flesh of the fallen to rise and surround them. They were already robbed of their metal parts, but there was no death for Phyrexians. Elspeth took to the air once more before the risen ranks could pin her down. These summoned walls shot up all the way to the ceiling of the fair basilica. Elspeth struck the wall, but Phyrexia was everything she laid eyes on. The ground beneath her, the air she breathed, the porcelain plating that did not yield to her sword. She concentrates again on her blade, making it glow until the aura gleams across her armor. Below, Vorinclex and Jingataxius' legions lash cables and close around her wings. She starts to descend. Elishnorn lets loose more lashes from her hand, but Elspeth chops at them with her sword, sending the Phyrexians tumbling backwards. She flies towards Elishnorn, dodging a slash, and lands a slice across the Praetor's arm. Elishnorn grabs Elspeth's wing, trying to convince her that Phyrexia offered the home she had always longed for. Elspeth cuts at Norn's fingers, but she does not let go, still trying to convince Elspeth the angel that her fleshy, angelic form was an imitation of what new Phyrexia had accomplished. Elspeth thought of her fallen allies, Nyssa, Nahiri, Ajani. None of them seemed upset with their new forms. Home could be whatever you made it. If she joined New Phyrexia, she would be with all of her friends. She could be with Ajani, and even her lost love, Daxos. They could be undying and ageless, all as one. 
Elish Norn compared the oneness of Phyrexia to divinity and considered angels as a shadow of divinity, the same way individuals were merely shadows of the Hall. The Mother of Machines taunted her, pointing out that in all the years she had looked upon Phoresis with horror, Elspeth was now embracing it but by another name, referring to this magic that has suddenly changed her into an angel. Elspeth tries to argue, but she can't say anything in her defense. Jingitaxius calls out, frustrated that his liege is so distracted by this angel. Elish Norn is reduced to rage, and she attacks her subordinate. Oil sprays as Jingitaxius' arm is torn off, revealing Elspeth the answer to their differences. She escapes from Elish Norn's grip and flies higher into the air, concentrating power into her sword. Norn was right, they weren't so different. However, her and her friends argue. They make mistakes. They had their own wants, dreams, and desires. The Praetors had disagreed. Jingitaxius wanted to ignore Elspeth, but Elish Norn wanted to destroy her. Elspeth understood Phyrexia. If she struck down Elish Norn, the other Praetors would do nothing to save her. Elspeth looked back at Elish Norn, so hungry for power. Phyrexia didn't really matter to her. Swords and shards of metal were pulled from the bodies of the Phyrexian army, from the walls and the ground. They were hurled towards Elspeth. Elspeth dives to evade the swirling metal and unleashes a ray of light. When the light fades, she's already halfway to the tree. While she wasted time arguing with Elish Norn, Chandra and Ren had almost reached the invasion tree. Elspeth had to make sure they got there. Ren, the dryad who can commune with the trees, had once heard the song of this invasion tree. It was faint. Despite her hearing it across the blind eternities, she could hear its whispers of pain. It was still alive, but just barely, a seedling clinging to a small shred of light as the darkness encroached around it. All living things wanted to grow, but the black oil of New Phyrexia was forcing its way through the tree's spirit. Soon there would be nothing left. And once the spirit was gone, Ren could no longer graft to it, and their plan, as brave and foolhardy as it was, would amount to nothing. Ren understood all of this, especially now as she lied dying on the cold pale surface of the Phyrexian stronghold. A completed Nyssa had torn her from her previous host, Seven, leaving her pale, frail body discarded, merely a torso left. She could not walk. She had barely the energy to speak, let alone help in the fighting that had broken out around them. She had remembered a bright light, flashes of gold gleaming against red sinew, an angel, then Koth, barking orders at Mirans, who had found renewed strength. Yet there was no new strength for Ren, only hope. There is a heavy burden on Ren's shoulders. She's in a place that, to her, shouldn't exist, a place her sisters would describe as a nightmare. She hadn't heard the song of the invasion tree since they arrived. Were they too late? Will she fail in the one task everyone counted on her for? The weight seems to lift, just a little bit, as Ren loses the touch of the cold steel beneath her, her body becoming weightless. Chandra, her dear friend, cradled what remained of the dryad and sprinted toward their only sense of victory. The route was covered by a Phyrexian army. The tree's spirits could be dead. Ren was already dying, and still, they tried. What they didn't account for, or at least they wanted desperately to forget, was what was hunting them. A completed Nyssa. Metallic vines of copper wire sprung the monster into the air, surveying the land, ensuring the hero's attempt would fail. It was her only purpose in her cold life. With that, she impaled any foolish Mirren who stood in her way. Launching a flurry of barbs, metal mimics of thorns, raining down upon the rebels. Koth managed to protect Chandra and Ren with a slab of metal debris hovered by his magic. Many of their other comrades weren't as lucky. Such as the quiet Malira. Her immunity to Phoresis was something amazing, a true beacon of hope on this dark plane. While she couldn't be completed, she could still very well die. Something Nyssa stood to prove with a javelin-like vine piercing the woman's stomach. Her breathing ragged, and screams agonizing, but she stays strong. Malira continues to fight, holding the wound tight and encouraging the others to keep moving. Not a moment later, Nyssa is back to her main target, 
lashing a copper vine around the foot of Chandra, whose flames she worried would hurt Ren if she cast them. With a violent tug, the pyromancer is pulled back and hung upside down in front of her adversary. Her valuable package, the dismembered Ren, left thrown in the air. Displaying a sense of unity Elish Norn had decried as missing among the mortal races, Amir and Rebel is there to snatch Ren up before she hits the ground. Continuing the journey, again and again, this unity never faltered. As one Mirren was felled by Phyrexians, another would continue onwards to the invasion tree. Her final carrier is an injured Malira. Rasping voice and labored breathing, stabbed through or not, she would bring Ren to the tree. Ren wonders how she can even move with such an injury, not that any of their will surprised her. Chandra, still lifted by Nyssa, was now being strangled with a vine, the planeswalker struggling to breathe. Ren sees desperation in her face, along with the unyielding rage in Nyssa's. She's coming for them now. Koth does his best to slow her advance, hurling boulders of molten metal at the Phyrexian, only for Nyssa to slice them harmlessly in two. But still, every moment of distraction gave Ren and Malira more time. Koth built up a wall of steel, cobbled together by crudely forged Phyrexian bodies and Mirren armor. It wasn't perfect, but given the war raging around them, still incredibly impressive. While the barrier did well to slow the Phyrexian army, now teeming in the thousands and dwarfing the few dozen Mirren fighters, Nyssa would have no problem crashing through. They needed to hurry. With Malira on the brink of collapse, she lifts the half-body of Ren over a small ledge and up to a platform to meet with the invasion tree. They had made it. But it wasn't just the journey that would take time. Grafting to the bean would too. And it was precious time they did not have. With Ren's life beginning to fade, she was unsure if she could complete the process. The elemental fire that burned within her threatened to consume her, all her remaining energy going to subdue the inferno. While Melira could cast a spell to help heal the natural flora composition of Ren's body, buying her some time, she could do nothing to help focus that inner fire of hers. That was supposed to be Chandra's job. She spoke to the flames. She could help Ren guide them, guide them into the invasion tree. No, not the invasion tree. It had a name. She heard it whispered. It would be rude to call him anything else. This was Realmbreaker. She begins to graft to the great tree. As she does, her vision is obscured by black, shadow, and dancing flames. It is painful. Realmbreaker does not want her here. It's rejecting her like a sick animal would be left to the wilds. It hurts both physically and emotionally. Still, Ren pushes deeper, trying to find Realmbreaker's soul. A glimpse of its natural being in a sea of black Phyrexian oil. Her inner fire flares. It hungers as equally as the Phyrexian Sludge, both all-consuming, with Ren right in the middle. The fire burns away at the oil, but at Ren as well. It cannot tell the difference, and Ren cannot control it. She's dying. Then, a crash. Loud enough that Ren hears it through the inner workings of Realmbreaker. Then, a light, bright enough to pierce the darkness. The Angel. A sword as bright and hot as all of Mirrodin's sons cuts through Nyssa, her eyes and mouth exploding with light. The blow staggers her, dropping Chandra near the tree, near Ren. She only takes a moment to gather her breath. They had talked about this moment before on Dominaria, controlling fire, shaping it, directing it. It's what she had to do now inside Realmbreaker. The voice of her friend is calming. Ren felt that with her by her side, she could do anything, even the impossible, even this. With the fire now taking on the ethereal form of Ren herself, it goes out and extinguishes the dark roots that surrounded the soul of Rembreaker. Despite its physical size, the true tree was small, nothing more than a sapling. Its green glow of life dimmed as it struggled in vain against the oil. Ren's fire had finally freed it, but there was no time to celebrate. She cast her fire her soul, bathing over Realmbreaker. Typically, a tree's soul would need to be mature in order for her to graft properly, but it was a rule Ren had to break. She could ask for forgiveness later. With a simple thought, the two became one, as her fire gives the sapling energy, rains like sunlight, everything a tree needs to grow strong. 
But this all happens at a greatly accelerated rate. Ren and Realmbreaker are stretched as they expand together. It's painful, so very painful. But at the end, the tree's spirit stands tall and strong. Shrugging off its oil, reborn. They had become one, Ren and Eight. Happiness swelling inside the Dryad. This union, however, was far from perfect. Realmbreaker was unstable because of his growth, and the taint that still ripped at his physical form. Ren too was weakened. The process had torn her spirit thin, her fire on the brink of consuming her and eight both. They didn't have long. Ren had to do the thing she had always planned on doing. Find Tafiri. Find him and bring him here. Her death and the death of the invasion tree wouldn't be enough to end this threat forever. It would take a hero for that, and Ren knew no better hero than Tafiri. Tafiri had been lost to them since he spiritually traveled back in time, but the Time Mage had taught her to follow Tangles in Time, a type of magic she was sensitive to as she could feel spirits across the multiverse. Even here, she knew Tafiri was out there, somewhere. She just had to fight through the Tangle to find him. And with Realmbreaker, her eight, now a part of her, she had that power. She talked to young Eight, encouraging the tree, letting him into her mind to see the truth of her thoughts, of her plan, and Eight agreed. Happily, he grew. He did not know where to go, though. He only knew the worlds his former master commanded him to go to. Now they searched in the darkness, punching randomly through reality to find this tangle. Ren was able to guide its branches as it grew and connected to more worlds until there. She had found it. A tangle in time, an anomaly in the blind eternities, Tafiri. As a portal opens up, Ren and Realmbreaker see a world unspoiled by New Phyrexia, the first of which Realmbreaker had ever seen. A blue sky showed over green fields, with people clad in armor but showing no signs of fear. This was it, the place out of reach of Elish Norn, a pocket world removed from time. Tafiri's people, Zalfir. She cannot leave to find Tafiri. Eight is merely a soul at this point, and without its soul, Realmbreaker will collapse into nothing. Instead, Ren projects herself through this portal, her weak physical form left with Realmbreaker as she now becomes a fiery silhouette, an avatar. She grabs the attention of her friend, a battle-hardened wizard who now looks at peace among his people gathered in a throne room standing by a queen. The queen is understandably upset at this spirit barging in, but Tafiri recognizes the figure and greets Ren as a friend. A small portal is ripped open. Ren hates to be ruining Tafiri's happiness, but the matter cannot wait. They need a hero. Tafiri, seeing what Ren had done, grafting to Realmbreaker, finding Zulfir effortlessly, he believed the multiverse already had its hero. But would come and help if he could. The portal wasn't big enough for the army that had gathered around them in the palace gardens. Aided by Tafiri's magic and prior warnings, the people of Zalfir were prepared for war. Tafiri was ready to step through alone. Before Ren stops him, the multiverse needed an army, not a single mage. Tafiri needed to bring everyone. Ren knew what this meant. Her and Realmbreaker would need to expand well beyond their limits, encompassing the entire army and shifting Zalfir's reality into New Phyrexia. The two would become one. It would tear her and her new companion apart. Ren asks her eight if he's okay with this, knowing what it meant. Sensing the moment, Realmbreaker agrees. Ren says her goodbye to Tafiri, who in turn shares his gratitude. Ren is at peace. At least she can die with one branch in Zalfir, and not wholly on New Phyrexia. With that, she wills Realmbreaker to grow. As realities merge, the angel who came to their aid begins to waver. Fighting the Grand Praetor was no easy task even for her, her sword beginning to dim. Their makeshift barricade is shattered as Koth's magic finally fails him. The gathered armies of New Phyrexia pour through the gates and freeze, both in confusion and horror. Ahead of them is a portal to a place lush and verdant, cultivated by careful hands and attentive hearts. It is a thing that horrifies them. So too do the warriors who cross over the portal, and the mage who stands at the vanguard. It has been many years since they were called to war, but Zalfir stands ready.
It is fortunate that angels are not New Capenna's only protectors. While they defend the crumbling buildings, demons and devils take the offensive. Working together is the price they pay to keep the inhabitants of this city safe. The youngest angel, Giada, wants to help, but she isn't strong enough to fight. All she can do is shout out to the others where they're needed the most, while Atraxa leads her army into Park Heights. The corrupted angel does not see the work of the Riveters. They're too small and inconsequential. They're beneath her. This would be her undoing, as an explosion ripped through the city and buildings broke free of their pylons and suspension systems. Angels watched as centuries of mortal work crashed down on Atraxa. The barbs of the invasion tree began to retreat back to their home, leaving a pathway open to a counterattack. Giada sees a portal to Theros's wine-dark seas, where the sky shimmers with the belief of its people, though the plane itself had no angels of its own. She directed the others to the portal, and the angels willingly burst through. They felt no fear, no hesitation, no regret. This is what angels do. They protect. There is one god on Theros who notices their arrival, the corrupted Heliod. He is too distracted to notice Kaya crawling up his carapace. That is, until she drives a dagger into his throat. The angels ensure no single drop of black oil touches the planeswalker as Heliod's sun sets. Kaya lands softly on the ground, and Ajani is there to meet her. But what does a god killer have to fear from a mortal? The portals of New Capenna shift, and Giada calls for the angels to charge into planes where they are worshipped, planes where they're hated, and planes where they're completely unheard of. Then the portals turn to New Phyrexia, and Giada sees her friend, Elspeth Terrell. There are thousands of Phyrexians charging the platform she's standing on. But she sees the portal and a smile forms on her lips. Giada calls for another charge. Those who go to New Phyrexia to join Elspeth will not return. But it is a small price to pay to save the multiverse. Armed to the teeth, the Zalfiran war clans were happy to meet the Phyrexians. Koth was confused as he watched them charge, but Tefiri explained with a smile. Ren had found Zalfir, and now it was trading places with New Phyrexia. They would join the multiverse again, and the corrupted plane would be flung into the abyss. There weren't many Mirans left to mourn their plane, but those who remained were determined to make sure New Phyrexia never forgot them. Zulfir had awaited their chance to prove their mettle against Phyrexia for years, and in mere minutes, they drove a wedge in the forces of the Phyrexian army. Tefiri rides at the vanguard, magic swirling around him, slowing everything so his army can pluck weapons right out of their enemy's grasp. The Praetor Vorinclex leaps towards the Zalfiran army, but hits the wall of Tefiri's time magic. No one, no matter how fearsome, looked intimidating while moving in slow motion. A smile breaks on Koth's face as he drives his fist into the ground, sending cracks to surround and protect Tefiri's army. Chandra sends fire through the cracks, shielding and fueling the Ascari's burning weaponry. Vorinclex finds purchase against the Wall of Time and is able to rip the jaw from Tefiri's mount. He's sent tumbling, and the Praetor stands over his prey. A blazing sword severs Vorinclex's head from his body, and an Ascari woman named Shella offers a hand to help Tefiri up. He thanks the woman, but before he can get back to the battle, he notices a figure above him. At first, he's confused, and then he understands exactly why his friend, Elspeth, is here with them now. She told him to order his forces to hold off Jingitaxius, as well as Elish Norn, so that she could take care of a completed Nyssa. The roof of the Sanctum cracks above them as new Phyrexian and Zalfir switch places in the multiverse. No amount of Phyrexian armor could withstand the forces of mass and gravity. Smears of black oil are all that remained of those who were squished beneath falling metal boulders. Then there is Elish Norn, towering above even her war machines her porcelain armor pitted and torn away, revealing ragged sinew beneath it. She strikes Tefiri, screaming that Phyrexia will never die. A volley of lightning, fire, ice, and bolts of verdant energy beat her back as she staggers, mouth open in shock. Clutching her wounded chest, she looked around and screamed at her forces, asking why they weren't protecting her. She was Phyrexia. The army stops, but only long enough for Jingitaxius to speak up. From atop his giant war machine, he declared that New Phyrexia had evolved beyond her, but her scraps may serve some use. New Phyrexia had turned against itself, and then there was the boom of a planeswalker's arrival. 
a badly wounded Ajani, was there to defend Elish Norn. For the brave Leonin, Phyrexia stood together or not at all. So he fought his former colleagues, the Phyrexian Centurions who turned traitor, with his axe and then with his teeth and claws, after his weapon was taken from him. Zolfirans capture Ajani in a net, but before they kill him, Tefiri shouts to take him alive on an instinct he cannot name. Ajani thrashes until a spell freezes him solid, and the warriors drag him away from the fight. Tefiri and the vanguard head straight for Jingitaxius, who's now distracted by his civil war against Elish Norn. The blue aligned praetor turns to see the glory of the Zolfiran army and taunts his organic foes. He gestures, and the war machine opens to spinning blades and spikes that stop their mounts in their tracks. Tefiri ducks the oncoming swing of a centurion. Blades, tendrils, and barbs all slow as he weaves his way toward Jingitaxius and his war machine. He lays a hand on the flat of a blade to stop them all from spinning. A Zolfirin woman soars overhead. Her giant warhammer cracks over Jingitaxius' head, sending him into the bulb of the war machine that held his newt-like body. The liquid contents of the vat spilled onto Tefiri, but new clothes were a small price to pay to watch Jingitaxius be devoured by his own creation. Tefiri looked toward the invasion tree, seeing that the portal was almost closed. Most had already gone through to Zolfir, but Koth, Chandra, and Karn remained. Tefiri calls for the retreat, as Zolfir fends off New Phyrexia to let the Mirans escape. By the time Tefiri makes it back to the platform, nearly everyone has gone through the portal. He can see his home waiting to welcome him on the other side. He can see Ren, too. She had become a delicate and ashen statue attached to the invasion tree. None of this would have happened without her. Tefiri wished he could do something to help. Then he sees it, an acorn in the ash that would grow as strong as she did on Zolfir. Tefiri plucks the acorn up and puts it in his pocket, then turns to face Nyssa with the remaining planeswalkers. Chandra didn't want to go through the portal without her even though she hurled boulders at them. Chandra steps out from Koth's shield and dares Nyssa to kill her. Tefiri wants to stop her, but a dismantled Karn assures him that Chandra will be alright, and beckons him over for a favor. Just then, Elspeth arrives in a flash of light, driving the pommel of her sword into the back of Nyssa's head. The elf falls from her copper armor out of the sky, and Chandra is there to catch her. Karn asks if Tefiri would buy him another moment, so that he may walk out of this plane under his own power. As time slowed, Karn starts to build a new body, layer by layer. On the horizon, Elish Norn crawls toward them as nothing more than a skinless abomination. Her former subordinates had torn the legs from her body, and Karn would do the rest as the others escaped. Karn felt heavy. Since Urza's death, he felt heavy every day in one way or another. The weight of the multiverse paled in comparison to what he sometimes felt, and on some days what he feels is the weight of the multiverse. Mirrodin was his creation, its corruption was his fault. He looked around at his friends, Tefiri slowing time to allow Karn his wish. He had finally righted the wrongs of his youth, and Elspeth had found her home after running away for so many years. Karn understood that you can't run away from your mistakes, you have to fix them. Karn steps forward to confront his wrongs, laying his hand on what remained of Norn's head. To assemble something was a delight, but in destruction there could only be solitude. Karn tried to avoid exterminating life whenever he could. What right did he, whose life was so artificial, have to end the life of another? But there was no other solution if he wanted to save the lives of the many. So he began to disassemble Elish Norn with his magic. He tears porcelain from wires while he wishes he could stop but he knows he must continue. The sight of Norn's corpse burns into his memory. Violence, even in service of the greater good, should never be easy. And it wasn't easy here. Karn needed to do this, to fix his own problems, and killing Elish Norn was the smallest way for him to take responsibility. It is done, and the Mother of Machine is a smear of red against the white platform. Karn joins Tefiri, who resumes time, and the two step into Zolfir's welcoming arms. The first step toward a lighter future. On Kaldheim, Harold, King of the Elves, jumps from a commandeered ship, wondering how long it's been since his brother, Tyvar, had sunk below the sea. How long had it been since Coma, the Cosmos Serpent, completed by Phyrexia, dragged him under the water? 
Miraculously, the fighting around him stops, and everywhere there's music and cheering. How long will it be until Harold gives up? How long would it be until Tyvar gave up on him? Harold never had to answer the question. Tyvar bursts from the water carrying the serpent's engorged head. He smiled, slapping its surface. Sure, his brother could see him. Harold doesn't often cheer when met with a boast he cannot match, but today, Harold was sure to make an exception. On Kaladash, PNLR braces for death. Her only weapon was a shard of metal she pulled from the wreckage of a plane. On a platform above the Aetherflux Reservoir, she was surrounded by Phyrexian soldiers. She watched the whirling blade coming at her. If she could push the hunk of metal off the platform with her, maybe she'd buy a little more time for the other survivors. Then, the whirling machine stood still, and the metal soldiers crumpled in place. Hope blooms in her chest as she sees all of Giapur covered in Phyrexians falling apart. Even their warships plummet from the sky. They've somehow won. Pia doesn't understand how this is happening, but she suspects the Healy will fill her in later. What she does know, and has always known, is that she can trust her daughter Chandra to get things done. She, no doubtably, played a role in Phyrexia's defeat. Everywhere drums call, filling the chests of the Zolfiran people. They had found a new home in the multiverse, while new Phyrexia lie broken and defeated beyond the reach of time. Tefiri can't help but smile at the sound of the drums. For him, it has been hundreds of years since he has heard the sound. While his people celebrated a victory, Tefiri was mourning losses. He searched for a spot to plant what remained of Ren, a small acorn. There were so many beautiful places, he didn't know where she would prefer. Where was the most fitting spot for the woman who saved the multiverse? In the end, Tefiri just walked, acorn in hand, until it felt right. When she was grown, she could move wherever she liked, and wherever that was, Zolfir would welcome her. Tefiri plants her on a grassy hill overlooking a town, waters it, and sits down next to the little mound to mourn. In the village below, flutes accompany the drums as the Zolfirans taught the Mirans how to dance to the song. After he is content with taking care of Ren, Tefiri joins the festivities. He had lived for centuries without these people, but to them, he was only gone for a short while. This place is his home, and yet, it isn't. He needed to learn to make it his home again, make friends again. In the wake of the Phyrexian War, that seems an impossible task. A pain pricks in the corner of his eyes. It's tears, as he watches Amirin attempt to play the Zolfiran flute. Tefiri allowed himself to weep, tears for his lost years, tears for Karn in his lost past, Tears for Nyssa and Ajani and all the others who may never wake now that new Phyrexia had fallen. Tears for those who cannot join the dance by the fire. In the dead of night, Tefiri gets to his feet and leaves the celebration, heading over towards the healing ward. As he searches for his friends, he takes time to visit the wounded, assisting the healers with their duties. Eventually, he finds his comrades, sequestered away in their own section. As he approached, he heard Kaya and Chandra talking about the possibilities of those who were turned by Phyrexia. Karn and Koth just looked upon Ajani and Nyssa, completed with metal throughout their bodies, interlacing with flesh and red sinew. They were breathing, but unconscious. They hadn't moved since they got back from New Phyrexia. Karn and Koth had worked to pull some metal from Nyssa's body, but some were essential for her to keep living, so some had to stay. Ajani still had all of the metal the Splicers had fit him with. The brilliant Sahili Ray's best guess was that New Phyrexia was keeping in contact with them through some kind of signal. The oil might have amplified that signal, but now that New Phyrexia was out of range, the oil waits for new orders. Receiving none, its agents are inert. Being a megalomaniac, Norn wouldn't want others besides her to control her army. So maybe without her, the oil was rendered unoperational. Their friends may well be asleep forever, but all they could do was wait for what happens next. Tefiri sees Malira, almost too weak to acknowledge him. Her chest wound had gone bad, and judging by her clammy skin and glassy eyes, she didn't have very long, regardless of what the healers did. At least Kaya had some good news. Liliana and Vivian were alright. Tyvar would be bragging about how he killed a Phyrexian sea serpent for ages. Kaido and the Wanderer were helping reconstruct Kamigawa. 
but there were still no signs of the completed Jason Vraska. Tidings from different planes probably meant very little to Malira, who spent her life in New Phyrexia. Malira gets Tefiri and Karn's attention, and though her voice is weak, she explains that she has an idea for fixing Ajani and Nyssa. She wanted to try cleansing their bodies of all benign oil. It might work if their hearts are untouched. Melira knew she didn't have much time left, and they would have to try soon. She wanted people to have hope that someone could be cured after they were completed. Then, maybe one day, someone else would figure out how to do it without her. Koth watches Elspeth approach, alighting from a tree and floating down in front of him like a feather. Koth asks if she will talk to him, as they walk out to a clear patch of grass. He can't remember the last time he saw so many plants, maybe never in his life. This place was very different from Mirrodin. Before he could say anything, Elspeth knew he wanted advice. He asked if she knew about Malira's plan, but she did not. She did know that Malira didn't have much more time, and that she would be sorry for her loss. There was sadness in her voice, but Koth couldn't see it on her face. When he first met Elspeth, she had cried so often, but now she was composed. Koth explained what Malira wanted to do, how it would probably kill her, and how Karn would probably burn out the rest of Venzer's spark as well. Malira would keep their bodies from being further infected, and somehow Karn would use Venzer's spark inside him as a filter for Ajani and Nissa's. Malira would clean their bodies and sparks, then Karn would place them back inside. He struggled with the idea of Ajani and Nissa getting a second chance while thousands of their brethren would not, especially considering all the harm and damage and lives they've took in the name of New Phyrexia. Koth was afraid, but Elspeth was not. She knew that everyone chose their own fate in the end, and Malira was choosing the end that she wanted for herself. Koth didn't know what they would do after, how they would send off Malira in this soft, lush place. There were a lot of new customs here, and the other Mirans would have to get used to it as they attempted to make Zothir their new home. He was more grateful than he could express to have a new home while, he was, while his was destroyed but still it would be a difficult transition. Elspeth embraces him, promising to always be his friend. If he needed her at all, all he had to do was pray. She leaves him without a goodbye, but it is time to say goodbye to someone else. Koth enters the healer's ward, watching as Mirrodin's five sons move across its new sky. Sahili suggested that it might be a consequence of the planes overlapping. It was an unintended consequence, just like him and the other Mirrans. This place isn't their home, just like it's not the Sons of Mirrodin's home, but at least now it had a little bit of home in it. Malira wanted to be outside when it happened, so they carried her along with Ajani and Nyssa in cots out to the grass. Tefiri forms a small time bubble around them, and Koth lays Malira down between the two completed planeswalkers. Karn stands over them while Tefiri takes a breath, giving them the space between two heartbeats to save their friends. Karn reached into their metal bodies and pulled out something shimmering and bright. There's a boom, and the two orbs Karn had been holding are gone. Malira begins to glow, and it spreads through Ajani and Nyssa. Another boom brings the orbs back to Karn. One pure, and one crumbling. Tefiri's heart sinks as Nyssa's orb flickers, and holes form, as shards of her spark fall away. Kaya helps Malira send the sparks back into their hosts, and Tefiri drops his spell. Ajani's good eye flutters as he sits up, asking where he is. He slumps back to the ground, exhausted, after processing that he's on Zolfir. Now Karn slumps over. The lights within him dimmed. He said he felt lonelier, that he would miss him, referring to Venzer, who had this entire time lived on in some way when he gave his spark to the golem. But now that spark had been exhausted. Venzer's final gift. Koth checks on Malira. She's gone. Kaya, Karn, and Tefiri throw their arms over Koth as tears take over. Next to them, Chandra shakes Nyssa. Maybe it was too much to hope for. You could spend every waking moment laboring to further a cause and never see it come to fruition. Wanting something so badly it threatens to break you doesn't mean you're entitled to it. And yet sometimes, the tension on Chandra's face melted to pure happiness as Nyssa embraced her. The two share a kiss. This is what they all fought for, what Malira died for, why Karn gave up Venzer's spark, 
why Tafiri spent hundreds of years trying to restore his home. This was life. The story has come to a close for New Phyrexia. Forevermore, they have been expelled from the multiverse, exiled if you were, freeing countless worlds of their tyranny in the process. A villain whose plight had plagued Magic the Gathering for over 25 years has finally met a just end. Hopefully, to never be seen again. I want to thank you all so much for joining me on this adventure through the March of the Machine story. If you enjoyed the video, please consider leaving it a like and becoming a subscriber. It goes a long way in supporting the channel. If you want to catch more MTG lore, be sure to check out my complete playlist on March of the Machine linked in the description below. And that's going to do it here, guys. And until next time, see ya!